I'm Emmanuel Williams, Chairman and CEO of Renaissance Global Media, your source of news, politics, business, and up-to-date information for everyday people. We're your conduit of information, making sure you're informed, connecting small businesses, individuals, large corporations, nonprofits, and the power brokers in between. We've got a seat for you at the table and in the room. And guess what? I'm your very own political plug. We're here live with Mr. Leroy Walker, a stalwart, prominent figure in the business community who has transcended all types of people and has great relationships all so over. So Art, tell us a little bit about Trustmark's commitment to diversity and how that translates into having such a power broker like Leroy Walker on your board and all the great things that y'all are doing in the community. Well, thank you. Um, and it's true, banks are a part of the community mm -hmm. and, and Trustmark has been a part of the Jackson community, the Mississippi community for over 130 years. 130 years? Absolutely. Oh, wow. And, uh, and because we're part of the community, we want representatives of the entire community on our board. And uh, Mr. Walker was a powerful representative of, of many different aspects of the community. I mean, he was very involved in the chamber leadership. He was very involved in his church. He was very involved with 100 black men. Uh, he was very involved with uh, all sorts of economic and civic activities. So he was a wonderful addition to our board because he helped us connect and helped us understand uh, many different aspects of the community. And, you know, if there was a favorite pro project of Trustmark that you'd love to highlight and talk about, what would that be? You know, we do a lot of things in the community. We, we do a lot of things um, from, from charitable work to mm -hmm. economic development work uh, to trying to help uh, help some of the disadvantaged in the community. We, we, we've done a lot of things with the city, with the chambers, with the canopy, with uh, uh, the hospitals. Uh, it would be over this country. Mr. Walker, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I'm proud to be here. Thank you so much, sir. So tell us a little bit about who you are. Well, uh, Leroy Walker, born in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, went to Tennessee State University, um, got a uh, master's degree from the University of Illinois uh, in public administration. Was very, very fortunate to uh, teach school in the East St. Louis, Illinois school system for wow. thir 13 years. Oh, wow. Uh, also coached football for five years. Very, very proud of that. Won the championship twi I'm twice. I was about to ask. <laughs> yeah, won the championship two years uh, while I was there over the five-year period of time. Uh, started a federal credit union in East St. Louis as well and uh, had an opportunity to look at uh, branching out into the business world. At that particular time, uh, McDonald's Corporation was looking for African Americans to participate in what they called a uh, um, notable position of letting African Americans uh, become franchisees. Mm -hmm. And I, in turn, uh, sought uh, that position and uh, wrote to McDonald Corporation, and they, in turn, uh, uh, gave me an opportunity to participate in their franchising uh, model. The franchising model was very strenuous. Uh, you had to go through all of the stages, uh, which I won't uh, elaborate on right now, but eventually you had to go to Hamburger University. <laughs> and there really is a Hamburger University oh, wow. in Oak Brook, Illinois. It's a very, very nice university of which uh, all of your training that you had done uh, during the uh, program would culminate mm -hmm. into you having a better understanding of how to run the business. Uh, they have an excellent business model, excellent business plan, uh, but it takes a very, very uh, concerted effort to make absolutely sure that you develop yourself in such a way that you'll be able to uh, uh, remove obstacles and work with all of the milestones. McDonald's teaches you uh, three things that are very, very important, which I have learned is critical in the business world. Those three things are people, product, and equipment. Mm -hmm. The most important of all three is people. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that you relate with and work with and you hire and have to run your restaurant and 
supervised and those kind of things are very, very important. And I see the same kind of thing that you see in uh, local government as well. People, product, and equipment. Uh, you got to have that same kind of model and the most important of it is people. Getting people to buy into you what your plan of action is, how you're going to develop and make things better for them, for their quality of life, and how you're going to be able to improve yourself as an individual. So uh, that has always been my mantra. That has always been one of my uh, positions in life, to try to uh, touch lives positively and lead the, as my daddy would say, lead the woodshed higher than you found. <laughs> so people, product, and equipment. So tell me, how did you end up here in Mississippi and how that mantra translated in your work here in Mississippi? Well, once I had finished uh, Hamburger University, uh, McDonald's made an offer uh, to me uh, to determine whether or not I wanted to stay in uh, the north or whether or not I wanted to come south. My parents obviously lived in Memphis, and if I had an opportunity to come closer to where they were, it really would be ideal because they were getting up in age. My mother right now is 90 three years old. Oh, wow, that's uh, and a blessing. She is really uh, doing very, very well. Uh, my father has passed and gone on, but uh, good man, good man, uh, good foundation. Uh, but at the end of the day, I was able to uh, uh, come to Jackson, Mississippi, which is where the stores were uh, that was offered uh, once I left Omaha. Uh, McDonald's gave me a good deal. They said, uh, we would trade you your two stores for five. <laughs> with That's the, a good deal. With the opportunity to grow. And we were able to grow it to 22 McDonald's franchises. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the question I have for you is with, with that particular franchise model, how did living and doing business in Mississippi uh, support that model, Well, if at all? A quick service restaurant uh, being strategically placed uh, where the traffic is uh, uh, definitely going to uh, be imminent. In other words, it's going to, uh, the traffic count is, is good. Uh, typically, people make a decision on the spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. And if they see a franchise of which is offering something at a price that they can deal with, with a value, and if you got service that is friendly, and you get service that's fast, and you have a clean restaurant, they will definitely come. So Mississippi is no different than any other uh, uh, place. One of the things that I did learn, which was a real uh, challenge, a real challenge is that the average volume in the state of Mississippi was not that of other uh, states. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's primarily because you have a lot of lot more poverty, if you will, mm -hmm. in the state of Mississippi. So discretionary funds to be able to do things, you know, are out there. That's why we had to do as much as we could to keep the value at a point where people would be able to purchase uh, the product. Um, eventually, uh, after doing the marketing piece, getting in the community, being part of the Chamber of Commerce, being part of the Economic Development District, starting the 100 black men, uh, doing your level best to uh, do all of the kinds of things in the churches and in the schools. We had a Martin Luther King program uh, where we issued checks to students in oratorical art, math, and writing contests and also uh, it was very, very rewarding for us. We had done everything that we could to lift the image of McDonald's and make people a little bit more so aware of the fact that an African American owned uh, the, uh, the franchise, which is very, very uh, good because then you begin to see uh, individuals saying to you, how is it that I can do that same kind of thing? What is it I need to do? Uh, to reach that, that goal as well. Do I have the stamina? Do I have the ability? Do I have the financial wherewithal to uh, establish myself in such a way to be able to own a business, not just a McDonald restaurant, but any uh, uh, entrepreneurial endeavor or venture 
that you choose to uh, participate. Wow, wow. You touched on uh, one particular thing that I think is important. Um, mentorship in business. How important was, did do you have a particular mentor over the course of your successful career that was instrumental uh, in your success? Well, typically, you know, we as African Americans don't necessarily have a lot of individuals who are necessarily in business for themselves. Uh, you have to seek them out. The majority of the people that I had seen who were successful maybe were doctors, mm -hmm. uh, maybe were dentists, maybe uh, very few operated a business per se, mm -hmm. uh, a convenience store or something like that. Uh, so you didn't really see a whole lot. But at the end of the day, what you would do is you would capitalize on whatever reading that you could do and whatever participation you could do. You could learn from others. There are a lot of individuals who don't look like me, uh, who would give you advice, who would talk to you about the challenges, uh, will uh, give you uh, uh, a roadmap, if you will, to how you can, it depends on how you couch your conversation with the individual and how you can make those things happen. Uh, but in terms of a mentor, I uh, utilize my uh, father's model, which is uh, go to bed, uh, uh, early and wake up early and be the first one to turn the light on and the last one to turn the light out, you know. My father had a similar way of life. So, in all your successful years, what would you say your most memorable business experience is? Well, I think that the Canton, Mississippi uh, restaurant was a very, very uh, impactful uh, mm -hmm. restaurant. Uh, the challenge for me was opening up all of the other restaurants that I did at single, at certain periods of time during the course. That was a challenge itself, making sure that you got enough people. The average McDonald's restaurant had about 56 employees per store, average. Wow. And it depends on the challenge that I had up in Canton is that we were doing our best to stay open 24 hours. So if you stayed open 24 hours, you needed more people. Security had always been an issue, um, and that was another challenge that you have in business today um, because a lot of the individuals that you work with uh, today in your community um, don't necessarily have the same degree of concern that you would have as a business person in the community to build your community uh, to the standard that it should be. So. You're going to have to work in all facets of the life to make absolute sure that some of those things come to fruition. Uh, very, very uh, challenging uh, is hiring people. Uh, typically, we would have to hire eight people to find one. Oh, wow. Uh, and I'm saying find one who really wanted to come to work on time, mm -hmm. who would dress accordingly, who would speak properly, who would learn the mechanics on the computer, on the, uh, the cash register, to be able to uh, be versatile. Um, be versatile, and I, I like for all of my employees to be versatile, where you learn all of the different stations, uh, because no one person should be able to, uh, uh, to inhibit you from being able to achieve your goal. So, uh, as a McDonald franchisee, you had to learn all of the stations. Uh, because eventually one day I may have to come into a restaurant and no one is there to operate that station. So I got to be able to do it myself. So you have to stay up, at, up on those kind of things. So those are the ch challenges that you have. Same challenges that any operator of any or any manager uh, would have himself or herself in a particular business. So you mentioned starting the 100 Black Men. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and, and why that was important. Well, in 1990, uh, I came to Jackson, Mississippi in 1989, and one of the things that I noticed is that the uh, young men in the community were really starving for uh, African American leadership. Uh, I wanted to see African American men band together mm -hmm. and uh, work with the children in the community, in the school system and work with young adults and talk to them about uh, their entrepreneur, entrepreneurial skill and skill sets. Um, 
I noticed that um, there are different fraternities, Kappas, the Alphas, the Omegas, the Sigmas. Uh, you got all of them that um, have their own separate model for what they want to do in their fraternities. But what happens if you ban all of them together at one time in one particular setting where you got doctors, lawyers, uh, bricklayers, um, you know, uh, carpet uh, uh, cleaning services, all of those individuals, uh, people who are working on auto mechanics, people who are working uh, in the school system, all together in one room. And you talk about what is it that makes a holistic community. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with the 100 black men. And you know, we've been doing a pretty good job. At one point we had about 138 boys that we were working with at one time. Oh, wow. And one of the things that we've always wanted to do is make sure that the workforce would improve. Uh, have individuals to understand how important it is to have a job, to be able to get the kind of morale that you need in your community, and to work together to uh, achieve a target for yourself and your family. Nothing makes a young man feel any better than to be able to take back to his mother or to his grandmother or to his family some of the resources that they have been able to earn. And uh, that's a very, very good feeling. And I think that every young man, particularly young men, uh, should want to do that. But you're going to have to uh, go through something to get to something. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that uh, is real important from my vantage point. Nothing is going to come to you free. Uh, nobody is going to come to pull something out of the sky and let you have it. You're going to have to earn it yourself, and you're going to have to be trustworthy, and you've got to make sure that you set yourself up in a position where your debits and your credits are in line and understand what it means to have the kind of uh, uh, financial viable position as a man or a woman. Uh, to make absolutely sure that you can stand on your own uh, and make some choices which are in your better interest. Oh, well, you said a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you've mentioned just so many great stories and so many mantras. Uh, uh, your wisdom reminds me of someone else I know, uh, our beloved Congressman Benny Thompson here in Mississippi. Uh, you also mentioned a fraternity whose name I won't say out loud, you know, but uh, you happen to be fraternity brothers, is that correct? Yeah, the congressman and I, and I are very good uh, friends. We also sit on the board at uh, Tougaloo College. Uh, I was chairman of the board for, at Tougaloo for 13 years, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the congressman and I worked very, very diligently to improve the educational foundation at the college. Uh, along with the uh, Board of Trustees. And trustees worked very, very hard. We all were singing from the same, same sheet of music mm -hmm. as relates to what we needed to do. Uh, the Congressman has done, in my opinion, more for Mississippi than any other congressperson that I have seen across the globe. Wow. And I have to say that across the globe. Um, anytime that you see an individual who really takes the time to um, sit down with regular folks and talk about issues and talk about the platform and talk about how are you able to mine through and meet some of the challenges that you have in your municipalities. Anytime you see a man who creates a venue where people can learn how to run a city, how to run a uh, department, uh, in a city, what public works really have to do. Anytime you see a, a man who is able to give you the kind of model and schematic and show you those kind of graphics, in my opinion, is worth his salt as it relates to moving forward. And he has done that. He has been an inspiration to me. He's been an inspiration to a lot of young men and young people uh, who now are politicians, who are now leaders in their community, and uh, the challenge now becomes uh, breaking that economic barrier. Uh, the economic piece has always been one of the silent enemies of the African American community. Not having access to capital, 
not being able to reach the targets that you have set in your platform. Uh, those kind of things are really demeaning and sometimes it causes us to uh, want to tremble as it relates to uh, getting the job done and you give up. Uh, so we're saying today, don't give up, continue to fight, continue to struggle, continue to make uh, strides toward the uh, betterment. You see what the Congressman is doing as it relates to the January 6th uh, insurrection. You saw uh, how he demonstrated himself uh, publicly across the nation. Uh, it was not embarrassing to any of the African American community. In fact, I got friends all across the United States to tell me, you know, I want to meet the Congressman. I want to be part of that conversation. When are you having something at, in Mississippi so I can come and meet him? So. Uh, very good man. Very Absolutely. good man. In fact, just for the record, I want the, the viewership to know that there is no representation for poor white America in Mississippi mm -hmm. except for the Black Caucus. The Black Caucus, in my opinion, served a dual role in helping black African Americans in Mississippi receive uh, some benefits, but it also spills over into white, poor Americans as well. And I see that representation on a daily basis because at McDonald's and any other places that I have been a part of and, and uh, participated, I see white America being able to take advantage of some of those opportunities as well, which is something that I think is rewarding. And that's why I personally feel that the Black Caucus is, uh, the State Black Caucus is uh, critical uh, from a foundation standpoint. Interesting, you, you mentioned um, access to economics uh, as a barrier for African Americans. What do you think some of the solutions to that access barrier? Well, we have not as of yet been able to determine what the model is in terms of getting buy-in from uh, our legislature uh, to assist us in building the very fabric that's needed. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of black banks. Uh, I think that Liberty Bank in the state in uh, is in Mississippi, which is a black-owned institution. Before, I think that there were uh, when I first came to Jackson, it was it was a couple uh, oh, wow. black banks. Uh, you do have Hope Credit Union, uh, which is doing a very good job. It's on the black leadership, but a lot of the dollars that's coming in there are federal dollars and dollars that's coming from. Uh, other uh, entities that don't look like us. Uh, uh, we're going to have to look at uh, our buying power, of which I know that you know about, Emmanuel. Uh, we have not been able to craft the model that would uh, put us on a measurable scale where that you could see a billion dollars, uh, seven billion dollars being able to recirculate in your community like it should. And then you got to make sure that you elect individuals who are going to safeguard and uh, have custody of making the right choices with the funds that's coming in. Too many mistakes are made by individuals who do not necessarily have the same uh, aptitude, uh, the academics. Uh, you know, we got to get away from popularity. Uh, we got to get uh, our mindset on getting individuals who are going to uh, move the needle uh, economically, and we have to do that. And the challenge has been not having the mentorship that you talked about earlier, uh, where we sit and talk honestly and above board about where we are today and what we need to be doing. We could stop the interview right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Um, that's a mouthful. Um, 
a lot that I agree with. Uh, very much so. Very much so. And so, well, I like your critical thinking. So whatever your critical thinking are in terms of any aspect that you think that uh, should be uh, uh, weighed in a different scale, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a scale or a balance. Absolutely. Uh, that uh, you and I uh, have to agree is uh, tempered with how you have the conversation with your uh, your audience and moving your platform. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I uh, I want to see African Americans succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, I want them to take advantage of opportunities that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of low hanging fruit of which we can pull from mm -hmm. and we're going to have to be intentional about the direction that we go in and we're going to have to make sound judgments on uh, the, what does it take to improve the quality of life overall. Wow. So with all of the issues, access to barrier, uh, lack of mentorship and a number of other things you mentioned, with that being said, uh, for Mississippi particularly, is Mississippi a good place for African Americans to do business? I think that Mississippi is an excellent place to do business only because of the fact that the scale is not the same as the scale that you would have in um, a large mm -hmm. metropolitan Agreed. area. Agreed, absolutely. Dallas, um, well, Mobile, or New Orleans, uh, look at Atlanta, uh, look at, and these in the South, I'm saying Las Vegas. Yeah. I'm saying look at all of the other. The scale of economics is different. Breaking through the clutter is difficult. Yeah. And I'm saying to you, you don't have a whole lot of uh, depth that you have to amass when you're in Mississippi. You should be able to achieve a goal, but you got to find what that find out what that model is. Mm -hmm. What is it going to take? Don't come in Mississippi and talk about selling skis. <laughs> you know, you know, know your sell, audience. Yeah. Like, hey, you know, you'll be sitting there alone for a long <laughs> period of time. Unless it's somebody going to Denver or Colorado yeah, or somewhere yeah, like that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so, because of your successful career, you're a m m member of a number of different uh, corporate organizations as a board member. Uh, Trustmark Bank, for example. Entergy Mississippi, for example. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I think that the uh, Trustmark Bank uh, opportunity for me was uh, clearly exciting uh, because I had an opportunity to interface with a lot of very, very uh, important and intelligent people as it relates to the financial world. Not only those who work at the bank, but also those who are with the OCC, mm -hmm. uh, those with the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're able to interface with them and learn uh, a whole lot more from that. Uh, that was one of my more rewarding experiences as a man to be able to be a part of the Trustmark Bank uh, Board of Directors. Uh, I was one of the longest seated board members at wow. Trustmark Bank as well. Uh, also, Entergy Mississippi. Entergy Mississippi was um, very, very, uh, and still is, very, very inspirational to me. Uh, uh, the CEO for Entergy uh, has a customer-oriented uh, philosophy mm -hmm. uh, and deals with uh, helping the communities that's in the footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, of Entergy. I love being a part of it uh, and I have learned a lot about uh, um, the inner workings of the power company uh, and interface with a lot of individuals across uh, uh, the Entergy foot footprint as well. And Entergy is not just in Mississippi, you got it in Absolutely. New Orleans and then you got it in Arkansas. And Entergy up in, I think that we even have and the nuclear power plant that's down in uh, in Port Gibson, mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi, where, uh, close to Alcorn State University, you know, which is uh, exciting to go down there. And I think that uh, Entergy has been a tremendous partner 
uh, for the state of Mississippi and one of the largest taxpayers mm -hmm. That's true. in the state of Mississippi. Uh, state of Mississippi. So I'm saying when an African American is able to say that he's a part of that board uh, that's contributing to that, uh, clearly it means a lot. And when tragedy comes, tornadoes, uh, thunderstorms and things like that, the power is out. Uh, we're on the phone talking to each other about where are you in your community, you know, the things that you need to be safeguarding and getting back to the entity representatives, all of those kind of things. Uh, same thing, the same kind of thing that you would see at the bank, people call you about a loan that they were trying to get and what do you think uh, it's going to take to package it in such a way that it would be acceptable and mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things. So I'm saying I have learned a lot from uh, being a part of that 100 Black Men of Jackson has taught me a lot. Uh, being a part of the Chamber of Commerce as a past chairman of the chamber and interfacing with all of those individuals, the Economic Development Authority, uh, talking to people with MDA, uh, talking to people with uh, MDOT, talking to people in the state government, and all those kind of things. All of that is uh, fantastic, but at the end of the day, you got to be very, very strategic in terms of how you deal with uh, the very facets of life that is going to help you to build yourself as a as a man. I think that's the perfect place to stop. Thank you so much for your time, your words of wisdom, people, product, and equipment. And equipment. Thanks so much for tuning in.